Okay, so you should have that reduction potentials chart in front of you, the one from our textbook. If you would also, on your equation sheet, look on the, I guess it's the back, there is a section on your equation sheet that says thermochemistry slash electrochemistry. And what we're going to do today, we will be doing some review from last class, but I'm also going to show you the ways in which the topic of electrochemistry is sometimes paired with the topic of thermochemistry. Okay? I want you all to, I, I believe I mentioned this last class that the AP exam has a handful of what they call big topics. Acid base is probably the number one big topic. Electrochem is another one. Thermochem is another one. Kinetics. And then maybe to a slightly lesser extent, like gas laws and um, drawing Lewis structures, predicting shapes. Okay? But here's the thing. One thing in, uh, that makes the AP exam very difficult is that the free response questions are not going to be focused on just one concept. They will interweave multiple concepts. And we really haven't done a whole lot of that. But today is, an, is a situation where I'm going to show you how two topics could be interlaced. Mm -hmm. right? And it really is through this equation right here, which you do not have to memorize. It's on your equation sheet. In that section, it's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh one down. All right. This is a concept we were dealing with last class. Can you remember what this is called? Not in your physics class, but in here. What is it? Cell potential, OK? Remember, we were calculating that in the setting of what's called a galvanic cell. What's another word for a galvanic cell? Battery. A battery. Okay. And it's a number of volts. It's, it's how much electricity are you getting out of this battery. Okay. This is a concept we have not seen for a very long time. Does anyone remember what that is? Gibbs free energy, okay? Do you remember the one and only reason you would ever need to calculate that? Correct. To see if a reaction is thermodynamically favored or not, okay? And that was a topic we saw back in the thermochemistry section. So we are tying these two concepts together. Now, what are these other variables here? Well, the F is a constant. It's called Faraday's constant. Don't memorize it. It's over here on the right-hand side. Okay. Um, the one that's written on your equation sheet is a little more exact than mine. It says 96,485. Okay, but that's a constant. And this lowercase m, we, have, we saw last class, I just didn't point it out to you. Let's refresh our memories, okay? Last class, we were using the chart from the book, that reduction potentials list. We saw two half reactions, we flipped one of them and added them together, okay? When you added your two equations together, what is an absolute must that has to cancel out. Electrons, okay? And what did you do if the number of electrons on opposite sides, they weren't the same number? What did you do? Okay, change the coefficients. Okay, we multiplied one or both equations times some number. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the coefficient of the electrons when you cancel them out. Okay, if it's three and three, then you plug in three there. Okay, so this is the coefficient of the electrons that get canceled out. Now, before we do any math with it, okay, um, let me see if you remember this. 
Okay, you just said a moment ago, this is used to decide whether a reaction is favored or not. Do you remember what kind of number indicated yes, it is favored? Very good, a negative delta G value, okay? Well guys, think about that for a second. All last class, our cell potentials, were they positive or negative? Positive. We forced them to be that way. That's how we decided which reaction to flip was so that we would get a positive total. If this is positive, notice there's a big negative there. If that number is positive, what should this come out to be? Negative. Guys, they mean the same thing. A positive cell potential is a galvanic cell that runs favorably, spontaneously, without outside intervention. And that's what that means as well. Okay. If the cell potential is negative, which we have not seen yet, but we will see at the end of this chapter, that's not going to run spontaneously. Okay. And here's another way to prove it. Positive delta G means not spontaneously favored. <laughs> All right. Now, if you would, look at the chart in your book, this reduction potentials list, and look at the number column where the potentials are, and look at the heading for that column. We see that curly Q E, and there's a degree symbol next to it. We talked about that last class. Do you remember what that means? Standard state. What are the conditions of standard state? Okay, all things aqueous are one molar. 25 degrees Celsius. Gases are at a pressure of one atm. All numbers from this chart were measured under those conditions. So what if you change one of those conditions? You are no longer at standard state, and you can no longer rely on these numbers. For example, okay, again, this is, I'm going to review with you just a little bit. Let me set the scene here. We've got a galvanic cell, two sides, two beakers. One side has a bar of aluminum, and that bar of aluminum is sitting in a beaker with some aluminum solution. Now, there's a wire connecting it to a bar of manganese, which is swimming around in a solution with manganese ions. Wire connecting the two metals. Okay. Guys, you will not be asked to calculate anything when you start changing things out of standard state conditions, but you will have to um, predict some things. Nothing to calculate. But, well. I want you to notice, it says predict how E cell, notice there's no degree symbol. What is the cell potential under non-standard conditions compared to when it is under standard conditions? Okay, such as, first situation, okay. All things that are aqueous ions, what are their, what's the standard molarity? What is the number? One. Okay. So this one, this manganese ion, I'm leaving in standard state, but this one I am not. Aluminum. Have I added more aluminum or taken some away? I've added more. It was one molar, now it's 1.5. Here's the thought process. Where is the aluminum ion? Here it is. If you add more, think Le Chatelier, it will shift in which direction? That is correct. It will shift to the left. Okay? Now, what does that mean? Well, guys, let's just remember what is the purpose of a galvanic cell? What's the purpose? To get electricity, to get power out of it. Okay? Well, a galvanic cell runs spontaneously 
favorably in the direction that it's written from left to right. I am doing something that's causing a shift in the direction that I don't want to go in. So what does your gut instinct tell you? Does making this change give me a galvanic cell that's putting out more voltage, more volts, or less volts than it was? Less, okay? This is a galvanic cell that's not giving me as much power as it was. So I would say the E cell non-standard is less than the E cell standard, okay? This would be making your battery less efficient. It is, it's not what you want. So, how do you make your battery more efficient? Well, how about you do this? I'm leaving the aluminum ion alone, but I've poured in more of the manganese solution. Well, where is the manganese ion? Here it is. Which way will this shift? To the right. Is that the direction that the, we want to go in? Yes. So this would be a situation where my potential is greater than what it was. This is like putting your battery on steroids, okay? You're bulking it up. You're making it put out a greater cell potential. What do you think about this situation? What's your gut instinct tell you? Nothing happened. The this, this cell potential would remain unchanged. Let me give you one other final scenario. What if I did this? Would I be getting a greater cell potential or a smaller? Okay, so I'm taking some of this away. Which way will it shift? To the right. So this would be another way that I could get more out of my battery. Okay? So, it used to be, and I'm gonna show you some equations that you do not need to know because it's not on the AP exam anymore. It used to be that you were asked to calculate this new cell potential. You don't have to do that anymore, okay? I wanna show you the equations because for those of you that go on to chemistry in college, you will use these equations. It's called the Nernst equation. Somebody's name, Nernst, okay? It's an unusual name, okay? That was low, man. Yes. Yeah. Not necessary. Yeah, I do hear everything. I do. Okay. This is the, these are the equations you would use. Okay. Notice that there's an E standard and an E non standard. Again, not on the AP exam as of this year, but you may see that when you go on to college. Now, what do you need to know? You need to know this fact, ladies and gentlemen. Please notice that that statement says E cell and there is no degree symbol, okay? When the non-standard cell potential equals zero, think about what that means conceptually. Your battery, your galvanic cell is no longer putting out power. What do you call a battery that's not putting out power anymore? A dead battery. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to blow your mind when I tell you that all a dead battery is, is a battery that has reached equilibrium. It has reached its happy place. Now that's not so happy for you because whatever you're trying to use is not working anymore. Okay? But that's the case. Okay, now, these are, do not write this down. These are not equations you will be using, okay? However, 
I do want you to notice that between the last slide and this slide, the last slide had Q in this place, and now K is there, okay? Because we're talking about a situation at equilibrium. If any of you have ever wondered how rechargeable batteries work, okay? In theory, every battery could be rechargeable, but let me explain, all right? Do rechargeable batteries go, go dead, do they? Yes, they do. And then you put them back in the recharger and they magically come back to life. Think about this from a, this is a, actually a very simple Chem 1 concept. You have a situation that is at equilibrium. How do you push it out of equilibrium? Add more something. Okay, add more in this, in the case of the rechargeable batteries, I believe this is correct, they just funnel in a whole heck of a lot of electrons to one side of the reaction. It would then no longer be at equilibrium. And what's Le Chatelier's principle say? If you push something out of equilibrium, it will always go back, right? The process of it going back to equilibrium is your battery working, providing voltage, okay? So that's all recharging a battery is, okay? So really, when you have a dead battery, your battery's just in its happy place. There's always a silver lining. You know, your car battery is dead, sucks for you because you're on the side of the road, but your battery is so happy. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, here is some practice for you. Some is review and some is new stuff. It says, consider the galvanic cell based on the following. I'm giving you the half reactions. You will need to find them in the chart. Determine the overall cell reaction. Calculate the standard cell potential. Everything in part A we did last class. Once you have a value for this, you now have an equation that will allow you to solve for Gibbs free energy. And guys, if you would please, look at the equation that, that I showed you at the beginning of class, that negative NFE. Look at the equation just above it. Negative RT ln K. If you have E, you can get delta G. If you have delta G, you can solve for the equilibrium constant. Do it. Do science.
Now, I want you to look at all three numbers that I've put a red box around. One of the things on the AP exam that makes it so difficult is that they, when they give you just one number representing something, they are expecting you to be able to interpret quite a bit, for a bit of information from that one number. Okay? For example, if you were given an equilibrium constant like this, would you say this is a small or a big number? Big number. You can get a lot of information just knowing that that is a very large number. Think about what K is. Products over reactants. A huge K value means what about the products? There's a lot of them. Which means our reaction is very vigorously going in the forward direction. Spontaneously favorably. All three of these pieces of information are saying, conveying the same concept. The fact that this is positive means this galvanic cell is running favorably, okay, on its own, without intervention. A negative delta G means the same thing, okay, a process that is running favorably. A large K means the same thing. Okay. Just expressing it in different ways. So, here's the take home message. If you have one of these concepts, you can get the others. This is how a, a free response question could connect electrochemistry to thermochemistry to equilibrium, maybe even an ice table. Okay, I'm just setting the stage for what you might see. You could see all three of those concepts put into one problem. Wouldn't that be fun? All right, so let's change gears here. Let's talk a little real world application. All right, all of these concepts are all fine and good, but what do they mean to us? Well. Guys, if you look two slides back, the problem that we just did, what was the cell potential that we calculated? What was the number? 0.32 volts. Do you think you could power a car with 0.32 volts? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Here's what you need to know. Most batteries... And I don't mean just a car battery, like a AAA battery, a AA battery, a 9-volt battery. Okay, maybe even as small as like a watch battery. Are not usually just one galvanic cell. There's multiple galvanic cells connected in series. Okay. Now, are we going to get into the physics of what if you connected them in parallel? No, we're not going down that road. Okay. But I want to show you, just for your information, okay, you, this is not something you need to memorize. This is the reaction that happens in a car battery. And just looking at this gives you an, a re, an indication of why, you know, when your car battery is truly dead, like you can't jump start it, it's, it's dead. It's in its happy place, it's reached equilibrium. I want to show you why you can't just, or you shouldn't, just pitch it in the garbage. And look what's in it. Do you want lead leaching into the groundwater? No, you do not. Look what else is in it. Strong, weak? Yeah. This is why you don't want to go digging around in any kind of battery, not just a car battery. When we, people talk about battery acid, that's what it is. And guys, it's not just sulfuric, it's very concentrated sulfuric. Please, don't ever crack open a battery. You're asking to get burned. Okay, here's another real world concept we need to talk about. Corrosion. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that word is defined as the spontaneous oxidation of metals. Okay? Now, you guys know I have a zillion pet peeves. If anyone's keeping track, you can add another one to the list. What's a more common word that most people don't use? Don't use the word corrosion. They would say something uh, is rust. rusting. Okay? Rust is a form of corrosion, but it is the corrosion of one specific metal, iron. Okay? You can't say nickel is rusting. You can't say, you could, you're right, but you would be wrong and you would get on my nerves, because that's wrong, okay? You say nickel corrodes. You don't say it rusts, because that is very specific to iron. Now, if you would, please, look at the reduction table in your book, the right-hand side, the very top reaction. It looks like that. Do you see it? Okay. If you all will recall, last class I explained something to you called the diagonal rule. It said anything on the left hand side, the reactant side of a half reaction, will react spontaneously with anything on the other side as long as it's below it. Do you remember that? So this direction. All right. That means oxygen will react with any metal as long as it is below it. Okay. What, give me ex one example of a metal that will react with oxygen. Nickel, iron, lead, okay. Guys, these are metals that if they are exposed to the air, which has this in it and this, will spontaneously corrode, okay? Now, the most common building material is iron. That's what's in steel. Now, this, re this half reaction has already been flipped. If I add these two numbers together, do I get a positive total? Yes. That means all buildings that are built with steel, exposed to the air, will corrode. That's a problem. That's a big problem. All right? But it's not just iron. If we go down the list, these metals will corrode. Copper, iron, lead, tin, nickel, cadmium, iron, chromium, zinc, manganese, aluminum, magnesium, lanthanum, sodium, calcium, barium, potassium, lithium. All of those metals, if you expose them to the air, will corrode without you having to do anything. Okay? Now, you are a structural engineer. You're building, you're assisting in the building of a brand new skyscraper. Okay? It is made of steel, which will corrode when exposed to the air. Hmm. That's a problem because buildings are exposed to the air. Well, good question. Remember, guys, this chart, imagine this entire side on top of this one. Can you tell me some metals that do not spontaneously corrode? Copper is above and below that equation, so it will corrode. Silver, gold, Mercury, okay. I don't think it's on this list, but platinum is another one. So why don't we just build buildings out of platinum, silver, and gold? It's too expensive. Silver has another drawback in that, and, and gold as well. They're very, um, they're soft metals. They wouldn't be very good for building, but they're also extremely expensive. So again, you are a civil engineer. You have to weigh cost-benefit analysis, okay? Iron is more affordable, but much more susceptible to corrosion. So we have to talk about how do you prevent that from happening, 
okay? First of all, guys, the corrosion of any metal is in itself a little mini galvanic cell. If we could zoom in on a place, a point of corrosion, you would see two separate locations. Let me explain. All right, this is a specific example of iron. Can you please tell me this half reaction right here, is this oxidation or reduction? Oxidation. Oxidation takes place at the anode. Okay, so I'm going to label this little spot right here the anode. Electrons flow from anode to cathode. The cathode would be over here. Okay, there's no wire, but remember this is a, a surface of iron. The whole, the whole surface is in itself the wire. Okay. You need water, when electrons flow to a separate site, that is actually where the rust builds up. Now, would you be able to see this with your eye? No. We're talking about a distance between these of like picometers. Okay? But technically, they are in two separate locations. Now, if you have ever lived in a beach community or a seaside community on the coast, okay? Is it surprising to you that if environments on the coast have a lot more salt content in everything, in the soil, in the water, in the air? No. They're by, you're living by the ocean. That's not surprising. Guys, having salt in this environment speeds this process, okay? So if you were to leave, let's say, like a brand new bicycle here at Oakton, and leave the exact same bicycle, it, take it to Ocean City, okay? You leave both of them outside, so they're getting rained on, okay? Let's assume the exact same weather conditions, all right? The one in Ocean City is gonna rust over long before the one here, because there's much higher salt content, all right? Which is why people, I mean, besides the fact that people don't like to have salt caked on their cars from the winter roads and all that, it's not very nice looking, but having salt on your car runs the risk of having some rust get to your car. What are your cars made of? What metal? Steel. What's the main metal in steel? Iron. Okay. So if you, should this ever happen to you, okay, um, and well, first of all, are we just, are our cars that we're driving around, are they just bare steel boxes? No. Well, let's hope not. Okay. They're coated in paint. If you get a chip in your paint, this is a good life, life lesson for when you become an adult. Should you ever have any kind of chip in your paint job on your car, get it fixed ASAP. Because any exposed metal you're running the risk of corrosion and rusting, and once rusting starts, it's very hard to stop, okay? Just FYI, a little bit of car care maintenance. All right. So, how do you prevent corrosion? You prevent it by keep, there's multiple ways. One is any way to keep the air and the water out, painting it, all right? Um, if any of you know somebody who is in the Navy, okay, and I'm going to get, I, I don't know the name, whatever the like lowest of the low rank in the Navy is, those people are always given the task of painting the boat, all right, and they ship out to sea for you know, weeks and weeks at a time, and they dangle these guys over the side of an aircraft carrier, and their whole job all day, every day, is to do nothing more but to use that gray paint and paint the hull of the boat. And they work their way week by week down, down to the end of the boat. And you know what they do when they get to that other end of the boat? They go back and they start over again. Because think about it, people. What's an aircraft carrier made of? Okay, you've got a steel aircraft carrier. 
What's a steel aircraft carrier floating in? Water with salt. Hmm, that sounds like a great combination. Okay, so when you're out to sea, you are constantly fighting the battle of corrosion. Okay, um, so painting is one way. Some of the paints they use in the military have zinc in the paint. Why would you want to do that? That's a process called galvanizing. If you would, right-hand side of this chart, you find the zinc half reaction. Do you see it? Look. Look one, two, three reactions above it. Do you see the one for iron? Okay. Let's pretend this is a multiple choice question which only has two answers. Which metal is more easily oxidized, iron or zinc? Zinc, okay? Here's the thought process. You look at those two half reactions. I said oxidized, which means you need to flip both of them around. What happens to the cell potential when you do that? It changes sign. Between those two, which one is more positive? The zinc. So why would you want to do this? The zinc will corrode before the iron does. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well then, yeah, but then you're going to have to like scrape the paint off because it's corroded. And yes, that's true. But one, zinc is a much cheaper metal than iron. Number two, wouldn't you rather have to just repaint the boat than having to replace the entire hull? Yeah, yeah you would, okay? All right. <laughs> There's something else called cathodic protection, okay? Um, smaller vessels will sometimes attach to the bottom of the hull of the ship or the boat a piece of metal. It's not in the paint, it's just literally a giant piece of magnesium, for example, hooked on the bottom of the boat. Any metal that will, will oxidize before zinc could be what they call, I love this term, the sacrificial metal. Okay, I love that term. Okay, because will this corrode? Yes. Will you have to replace it? Yes but it's much cheaper to replace that than the entire hull of a boat. So, the take home message is for any of you that wanna go into engineering, if you want to make a lot of money, the billion dollar business of pro corrosion prevention is out there waiting for you, okay? It is fascinating, <laughs> I know, okay? Here is our last topic in this chapter. Electrolysis. Ladies and gentlemen, if I asked you, which we did just moments ago, to calculate the galvanic cell's potential, will it be positive or negative? Positive, okay? If a, gal if a, um, if a cell potential is negative, will it run? No. Will it run spontaneously? No. You can force it though, all right? If you run a galvanic cell backwards, you will have a negative cell potential. Is that gonna happen on its own? No, you have to force it because it's a non-spontaneous process, okay? Electrolysis is a process used to, we talked a little bit about this last class, get mass amounts of some maybe rare metal, okay? So that's what the process is used for. Now, let's just review a little bit, okay? Let's review the parts of a galvanic cell. What do you think I'm representing with this turquoise box? A voltmeter, okay? Anode, cathode, electrons always flow from anode to cathode. Can you tell me what's missing from this picture? Salt bridge. Okay, sorry, I forgot. I'm gonna change the slide. This is like one of those compare two pictures, what are the differences? 
on the next slide there are three differences. What's, what's the one that's very quickly? Okay, this is not a voltmeter anymore. This is a battery. Why do you need a battery to run an electrolytic cell? Because it's not spontaneous. This is not going to happen unless you provide power to force this to happen. That's difference number one. What's another difference? Okay, the words anode and cathode switched. The location of zinc and copper did not. But remember I said, one of these rare times in this class, electrons always flow from anode to cathode. I don't get to say no exceptions very often. Anode to cathode. What's the third difference? Electron flow is going from right to left, not left to right. Okay? This is an electrolytic cell, ladies and gentlemen. All right? And there is math associated. I'm going to jump right to a practice problem. It's easy. Here we go. It says what mass of each of the following substances can be produced? Because that's the purpose of an electrolytic cell. If we run this cell for one hour and we force a current of 15 amps. Okay. Physics people. What's another way to express the unit of an amp? Nope. Something per second, what'd you say? Coulombs per second. <laughs> Coulombs per second. Okay. How many seconds are in one hour? Thank you. 3,600. I'm going to multiply these. I'll do the math for you. You end up getting this number. Four thousand coulombs. Physics people, what? What's a coulomb? What, what is this? Okay, it's a, it's a measure of charge. Okay, in this case, let's think electron charge. Okay, this is telling me how much charge I am forcing through the wire. All right, if you would please, everybody, look on your equation sheet. Find that Faraday's constant and tell me what its units are. Okay? Coulombs per mole of electrons. Watch. Coulombs per mole of electrons. And this is what we get. I want you to understand what I just found, what this is. We are forcing electrical current through the wire, and that is how much, how many electrons I am forcing through that wire. We'll do number or letter A together. We are trying to make mass amounts of cobalt metal. And I've got an aqueous solution of cobalt plus two. Could you please tell me what would complete this half reaction right here? Two electrons. Okay, great. Let me start with. Oops. Let me start with this number I just calculated. There will be two moles of electrons for every one mole of cobalt made. Can you all see how I'm going to get to grams of cobalt? Where is this number going to come from? Periodic table, which is 58.9. Okay, 
and this is what we get. I think that's pretty cool. You can run this system for an hour, and when you're finished, you will have a 16 gram lump of cobalt metal. Um, if you're, let me just jump ahead to letter C just to save some questions. What is the charge of chromium within this compound? Positive six. So what would I add to finish that half reaction? Six electrons. Okay. You do B and C. So that's it for chapter 17. Woo! It was short.